Which oil company produces the most EOR oil from any American field? Which company processes and re-injects more gas from one American field than Great Britain consumes every day? Which company operates miscible gas schemes onshore and offshore in Europe and America? Which major oil company tops the league for oil recovery? BP at the leading edge. This is a typical reservoir fluid from some 1,000 meters beneath the ground. As this fluid meets the atmosphere, the huge pressure change causes the gas, previously dissolved in the oil, to come out of solution. This gas is a commodity which can be sold with other oil products, but it also has another valuable role to play. By injecting gas into some oil fields, we are able to increase the recovery. This video is about the many opportunities to do that. When oil is produced from the reservoir, the pressure would fall unless it was replaced by another fluid. In this case, we're injecting water. Water is very effective at maintaining the pressure, but has limitations in its ability to drive all the oil to the producers. For that reason, this well is also connected to a gas injection line. Gas can be injected either on its own or together with water. By doing this, in many cases, we are able to recover more oil. To explain these techniques, Andrew Folk. The first thing that strikes you when you look at gas, uh, compare it to water, um, is its lower density. And we can exploit that in the reservoir because water, being more dense, will tend to slump underneath any oil, whereas gas, being less dense, will tend to move upwards uh, towards the top of any reservoir structure. And this uh, takes on to, uh, significance when you look at reservoirs where oil is trapped in the top of the, of a, of the reservoir. If we take a typical reservoir of oil-bearing rock that has structural highs that are not penetrated by wells, we can see that a water flood will not sweep the higher levels, leaving a pool of so-called attic oil. By injecting a gas that is lighter than water and oil, this attic oil is displaced towards the producing wells. This method of exploiting the low density of gas can be applied to a number of more complex reservoir structures. For example, in BP's Harding Field in the North Sea, attic oil is trapped in small bulbs of sand in the cap rock. Reservoir engineer Richard Pollard explains the problem they face. Well, geologically, the Harding Reservoir consists of Eocene sandstones of very high quality. The porosities are about 35% and the permeabilities are very high at about 10 darcy. The reservoir sands consist of two main types. We have massive sands around about 150 metres thick. On top of these, we have sands which have been injected into the overlying mudstones just after the reservoir was deposited. We know they're in communication with the main reservoir units because of pressure data that we acquired just after the well was drilled. They are currently running a water flood at the Harding Field, producing about 90,000 barrels of oil a day. But this is only from the main reservoir body, not the overlying bulbs of sand. We believe that this water flood will not be very efficient at sweeping oil from these injected sands in the overlying mudstone structure. So what we're planning to do with one of our water injectors is to convert it to allow us to simultaneously inject small volumes of gas along with the main bulk of the water that's going into that well. Once the gas gets into the reservoir, it will rise very quickly and displace oil efficiently out of them. Water floods will also be inefficient in reservoirs where the vertical resistance to flow is low. Water will tend to slump to the bottom and underrun the oil. But gas is not only lighter than water, it also has far greater mobility. These two physical properties can be exploited together. 
for example, in the Magnus Field in the North Sea. Here, the upper reservoir consists of a series of sands with intermittent shales. These shales are one of the factors that will limit the potential recovery of a water flood. The main reservoir in Magnus comprises a series of stacked sand bodies with a net growth of about 85%. That means a large proportion of sand with respect to shale. So there's about 15% shale in the whole formation. The way that the Magnus field has been uh, depleted so far is to put a series of producers effectively running in the crest of the field and a set of injectors that run along the periphery of the field. And what we're doing there is basically injecting water at the uh, periphery and off-taking from the crest. And that's a classic line-drive type water flood. So far, recovery is running at around 50 to 55 percent, which is relatively efficient. The next stage is to use EOR techniques to raise recovery up to about 70 percent. They have particular targets in mind where gas injection can help. We see three principal types of targets. The first one is created when basically the water flood starts to slump within a sand body and leaves a residual oil lens below a shale. Because shales are impermeable, slumping water will tend to run over the top of the shale until it reaches the edge and will continue its downward progress, leaving a lens-shaped pocket of oil under the shale. Gas, being less dense than water, will sweep these targets to the producing well. But there is another target in Magnus that the other physical attribute of gas, its greater mobility, can help to produce. The second one is where we have a shale and a sand body, and we have permeability reductions within that sand body that allow the water flood to continue in the high permeability part of the formation but not sweep very effectively within the low permeability parts of the formation. And that's where gas comes in. We can increase the mobility and start to move that residual oil out into our producers. Gas is a much more mobile fluid than oil or water. And as a result, it's much easier to move the uh, gas through rock, which presents high resistance to flow, i.e. low permeability rock. And Magnus, uh, as we've already seen, can use this property of gas to displace oil which is trapped in low permeability layers which water would not normally move through. In any sequence of rocks where a relatively low permeability layer is sandwiched between a barrier and a high permeability layer, water will be efficient in sweeping oil from the high permeability layers and far less efficient in the lower permeability. If gas is injected in addition to the water, then the lower permeability can also be swept. The high mobility of gas is also significant in the formation underneath the Magnus main sand, known as the Lower Kimmeridge Clay Formation, or LKCF, where, because that whole formation presents a low permeability target, the high mobility of gas can be used to displace the oil more easily. So we have this fundamental problem with the LKCF of how do we drive the water floods through into the LKCF, into these isolated sand bodies, and effectively sweep them. One, because they're poor of permeability, and two, because they're poorly connected. Where gas comes in is to increase effectively the mobility of the oil and allow us to sweep that uh, oil that remains in the ground more effectively. In these poorly connected sand bodies, water sweeps the lower structures, but is not able to penetrate the higher ones. Gas, being lighter and more mobile, is able to travel through these upper targets and recover the oil. Changes in permeability can occur in individual sand bodies like these, or as layers within the main body of the reservoir. And permeability reductions can also be significant at a much smaller scale. Now, there are other fields where you don't have distinct layering like that, but you have the same problem. And these fields are ones where you have a finding upward sequence. This is what they've found in the Prudhoe Bay field in Alaska. In some of the lower areas of this large tilted reservoir, the sand grains that make up the sandstone have been sorted as they were laid down. Large grains are found at the bottom of the sequence, getting progressively finer towards the top. What happens in a water flood is that water will follow the high permeability route, bypassing oil where the sand grains are finer. Injecting gas with the water will remove this oil. 
and gives a much more efficient sweep than could be achieved with water injected on its own. And gas injection has further roles to play in improving oil recovery. So far we've looked at just the physical properties of gas, its low density and high mobility. And in many situations those alone are sufficient to extract more oil out of the reservoir. We tend to look quite hard at our reservoirs to identify those targets where we can use gas to extract more oil and we often have to tailor make the solutions, i.e. choose carefully where we inject the gas and how we inject it to extract that extra oil. And not only can gas injection extract more oil and increase your recovery from the reservoir, but it can also protect your reserves. One way in which gas injection can protect oil reserves is in fields with an existing gas cap. For example, the Andrew field in the North Sea. The reservoir engineer is Amy Frankenberg. The Andrew Reservoir is a simple dome structure with a gas cap on top, uh, oil leg, and an aquifer underneath. We've drilled a series of horizontal wells from a central platform that move in a radial pattern around the field. We also have one injector where we inject gas into the gas cap. They need to maintain a careful balance between the injected gas pressure and the offtake rate on the wells, so that the gas oil contact does not rise. This is important because if too much gas is produced, the gas oil contact will rise and this can lead to oil loss, as Andrew Folks explains. If you have a, a gas cap existing in the reservoir and you overproduce gas from that reservoir, i.e. you produce free gas from the reservoir, the danger is that you'll start to move the gas oil contact up. And as you do so, oil will invade rock which had previously only been occupied by gas. When you do that, uh, the oil will, if it ever leaves that rock again, will leave a residual saturation there, and you've trapped that oil there. So by injecting gas into the gas cap, you can begin to control where the gas oil contact is, and hence prevent losing your reserves in that way. While it is important to take measures to stop the gas oil contact moving up, driving the gas cap down can have advantages because it drives most of the oil in front of it. This is part of their strategy in the Andrew field. The results to Andrew to date have been very good. In all our wells, we've had some gas breakthrough and some water breakthrough, but the time to gas and water breakthrough has been as expected, and the rate of increase in gas and water is also as expected. This gives us confidence that we're probably going to have a maximum recovery of oil from the Andrew Reservoir. There is still residual oil left in the rock after displacement by gas. The residual oil will move downwards under the influence of gravity, and this can be used to remove this oil from the reservoir. The drawback of gravity drainage is that it takes time, but if the target is large enough, it can certainly be cost-effective, as at Prudhoe Bay in Alaska. Here, gas injection is used to move the oil that is draining downwards laterally towards the production wells. Gravity drainage is a slow process, but even so, over the lifetime of a field like Prudhoe Bay, it can still recover a lot of oil. In Prudhoe Bay, it will take the residual oil down from about just under 30% down to 16%. So far, we've looked at the physical properties of gas, density, and mobility, and how these properties can be exploited to extract more oil from the reservoir. However, another feature of gas, its ability to interact with oil, can be used to increase recovery even further. Oil can absorb hydrocarbon gas until it becomes saturated, at which point free gas will exist. So in reservoirs where the oil is not saturated, gas that is injected will dissolve into the oil. This causes the oil to swell and displace some of its volume towards the production wells. Oil swelling is just one process that can unlock residual oil reserves. Another is oil vaporization. As well as getting gas to dissolve into the oil, in some situations we can actually get the uh, oil to move into the gas. Gas is typically made up of methane, ethane, propane and butane and some heavier components. If we select a gas which is very high in methane content, we call that a very lean gas, we can actually encourage the oil to vaporize into the gas stream and hence use the movement of the gas to then carry these hydrocarbons, which would otherwise be uh, trapped in the rock, towards the production well. 
and they're using this vaporization process in Prudhoe Bay to access a billion barrel target which otherwise would not be recovered. The flow that we're targeting is residual and thus immobile. The only economical way that we can get it out of the reservoir is through gas cycling, where the residual oil is transferred into the lean gas through vaporization and then produced at the production wells down structure. At Discovery, Prudhoe Bay had about a billion barrels of residual oil in the original gas cap. The gravity drainage process, while it's efficient at Prudhoe Bay, there'll still be about four billion barrels of residual oil in the expanded gas cap region. This residual oil cannot be recovered through conventional depletion processes. Well, this is a large target in excess of five billion barrels. It's a, it's a key target for the vaporization process. Another process that involves a change of phase between gas and oil is condensation. But this is a process that should be prevented rather than encouraged. And again, there is a role for gas injection. Some reservoirs contain gas which is rich in intermediate to heavy components. And if we extracted this uh, gas by just allowing the reservoir pressure to fall, these intermediate to heavy components would condense out as a liquid in the reservoir. And this has two disadvantages. The first is this oil that we've generated in the reservoir rock will actually become trapped there. And the second disadvantage is that oil can bank up around the production wells, inhibiting the flow of gas into those production wells. One way to overcome this disadvantage, which has been successfully used in Cupiagua in South America, is to cycle a lean gas through the reservoir. This maintains the pressure and re-vaporizes any condensed fluid, allowing the rich gas to be recovered at the production wells. In Cupiagua, this technique will recover an additional 450 million barrels of oil. In all the processes we've looked at so far, the gas and oil stay as distinct phases, by which I mean they have an interfacial tension between the oil and the gas. And we say that this is immiscible. Now, the, we can select a type of gas which is miscible with the oil, by which I mean they become a single phase, and the oil begins to flow with the gas. With immiscible gas injection, even though components may have been exchanged between the gas and the oil, there remains a distinct gas phase and an oil phase with an interfacial tension between the two. But in a miscible gas flood, when the gas makes contact with the oil, the interfacial tension approaches zero. The two fluids then effectively become a single phase. Continuity between the oil drops is re-established and oil flows to the production well. Miscible gas floods can be highly effective, leaving oil residuals as low as 3%. There are many ways of achieving a miscible gas flood. The most obvious is to choose a gas composition which is immediately miscible with the oil as soon as the gas enters the reservoir. We call these first contact miscible gas floods. But more usually, we choose a gas composition which will become miscible with the oil as the oil and gas move together through the reservoir. And we call these multiple contact miscible floods. The world's largest hydrocarbon miscible gas injection scheme is in Prudhoe Bay. It has been highly successful, as reservoir engineer David Aldrich explains. We're estimating that we've already recovered and shipped to market about 150 million barrels of oil due to the miscible gas process alone. That's in addition to the water flood and the primary barrels that have also gone. And that leaves us about 350 million barrels to go. We have about 150 individual patterns, and we implement it by alternating the uh, injectors between injecting water and injecting gas. The target to, for the miscible gas process is the very large amount of oil remaining at the end of the water flood process. The oil itself is located at the bottom of the uh, structure at Prudhoe Bay around the rim uh, of the oil accumulation. So what we're actually doing is uh, cleaning up after the water flood. A large amount of the oil is left over, and the gas can go in some places that the water can't. The water flood can reduce the amount of oil in the rock down to about 30% of the pore space, but the gas can scrub out almost 100% of the uh, oil that it contacts. The key is to get the gas to go into all of the rock, or as much as possible. 
In addition, there's some exciting techniques that are coming online that are targeting some of the oil at the top of the oil column where the gravity drainage process has been going on. As we have seen, gas injection can be used in many ways to improve oil recovery. Some of the techniques exploit the physical properties of gas, such as its low density and greater mobility, to displace the oil or to maintain gas cap pressure. Lowering the gas oil contact will also displace oil and permit gravity drainage of the residual. Injecting a lean gas into certain reservoirs can also prevent condensation. Injected gas can also interact with the oil. Components from the gas can be absorbed by the oil, causing it to swell and move to the producers. Components from the oil can vaporize into the gas and be recovered in this way. And then, by using a miscible gas, the interfacial tension between oil and gas reduces to zero, and they can be made to flow together as a single phase. BP is continuing to pioneer novel gas deployment techniques, such as double displacement, alternating rich and lean gas streams, or the use of horizontal infill wells. Carbon dioxide reclaimed from flue gas can be used as a miscible injectant, which has many environmental benefits. Steam or air are also important media for getting thermal energy into the reservoir. We have seen a number of ways in which gas can be utilized to add value by recovering more oil. In addition to these processes, we are also pioneering novel techniques to expand the potential of gas injection. We inject gas in many ways into a wide range of reservoirs, from vertical gravity drainage and vaporization schemes at Prudhoe, through horizontal floods at Miller and Witch Farm, to single well huff and puff schemes in Venezuela. In many cases, we have stopped selling gas, such as at our ULA project, and we are now re-injecting it to recover more oil. Our experience allows us to plan to inject gas from day one of the project, as at Badami in Alaska, or to rely entirely on gas injection to recover the oil, as in our North Star project, also in Alaska. In some cases, complete field developments now rely on the incremental oil from gas injection to be economic. All this allows us to achieve world-class levels of oil recovery from the fields entrusted to us.